Ah, the Headless Horseman. That's a wild one. You know, they say he used to be called Michael when he was still alive, although I don't know if that's true. But yes, he was alive once. Long time ago, goodness. Must have been almost a hundred years at this point. They say he had a, a family. Father, mother, two siblings, and a girlfriend even. Quite successful, well off. He worked on a farm. They say he, he didn't do much, but he did, um... He loved horseback riding, and he had sword riding training that he would often train with his mates. Anyways, um, he was the oldest, see, and as the oldest, he was sworn to provide for his family, um, no matter what happened, and unfortunately, quite a lot happened. Um, they were at war with uh, an enemy kingdom, and of course, when they when you're at war, you have to get all the men you can to fight for that war, so they, of course, went around, the king's soldiers, I mean, went around grabbing people that they had to take off to war. And, of course, with Michael being the strapping young lad that he was, they uh, picked him up pretty quick and, unfortunately, had to say goodbye to his mother, father, siblings, and girlfriend. But he said, don't worry, I will be back, and I will take care of you. I promise. And, of course, that promise would come back to bite him. I'll tell you why in a second. Um, so we set off with the king's soldiers, and he traveled for gosh, a week, maybe a week and a half to get to the training camp. He was trained up, but thankfully he already had quite a few skills in swordplay and, of course, horseback riding. And he wanted to be in the cavalry since they sent him off to war, so he got to horse training pretty quick there, and he picked it up, and he actually excelled. So most of the um, the recruits weren't able to ride a horse, so he was um, easy pickings. Anyway, so he was in the, the cavalry, but... Um, what do they call that? Battalion, I guess, I suppose. Um, but with, uh, with that battalion there, unfortunately, they often sent out alone without any backup or reinforcements. They're the flanking people, so they can quite easily get surrounded if they're not careful, and that's exactly what happened. They had the two armies there, they had the group of men, other group of men, and there was kind of a... Um, not exactly a crevice or a bottleneck per se, but like there was two hills on either side that forced the armies to be between and strategically the enemies had placed some of their mages in that. So as the horsemen tried to gallop up the hill and then charge down the other side, um, the mages unleashed a terrible volley of magic and gosh it was a slaughter. Yeah, when I've heard of tales of this it must have been thousand or more horses died. It was terrible. Anyways, of course, Michael was one of those people. But Michael was different, you see, because he, he had a very strong spirit. He didn't give up very easily. So when that bolt of magic came careening toward him, his last wish was, I can't die yet. Let me stay alive. And then, of course, that magic hit him right in the head. And, um, it's a bit gory, I'll admit, but it was blown to a million pieces, or a thousand pieces, or more than two pieces at least, but anyways, head clean off, or not so clean. <laughs> anyways, he died, unfortunately. It was pretty tragic. His family was quite sad when they heard the tale um, sometime later after that, but it was at that moment, almost in an instant, where he was transported, and he was a virtuous man, of course, and he was, um, went to the gates of heaven, and asked, he was begging Peter, who was there, like, please, let me go back, I have a father, a mother, two siblings, and a girlfriend that I promised to take care of, and that promise was, of course, the only thing that gave him that option in the first place, and Peter was like, well, I'll have to talk to the big man, so he leaves, stays for a little while, and comes back, and he says, all right, I agree to make you a deal. You can go back to Earth, but you only have a lifetime. And you'll have 60 years from the time that you come back alive, take care of your family, and then you're coming right back here. But if you're unable to take care of your family, then you will not be returning to the gates of heaven, to say the least. Um, 
And of course, Michael had to think about this for a second. Oh goodness, he's risking the pain and torture of, well, hell, but on the other hand, he could finally fulfill his promise, and he had to fulfill his promise, so he agreed to the deal, and he got sent back. And to his surprise, he woke up, but he couldn't see. It might have been nighttime or something. This was October 31st. It was a very spooky occasion. Part of the reason his soul was able to return to his body so quickly. Um, he was stumbling around, feeling around, and came across what felt like another of his comrades. And he's like, oh, I'm sorry. He puts his hands together to pray and tries to put his head against his hands, but his he head goes right through, of course, because he does not have a head on. And that's when he realizes, I, I don't have a head. I can't see. What am I meant to do? And so he keeps crawling around and... He's like blind, he's frantic, he's like, well, am I alive? How am I alive without a head? I thought this wasn't part of the deal, because he returned to his body, but his body didn't have all of its pieces. So he's stumbling around, and of course, since it was the fall season, by sheer random chance, after must have been several days, he wandered, he actually came across a pumpkin. And see, this was the closest thing, he thought it was his head, actually, at first. It was like, oh, this could be my head. And he felt the stem, and he was like, Oh, come on, I thought I found it. And he was like, well, maybe, maybe just maybe this could work. So he pulls out his dagger, stabs it in, carves out a few eyes in almost a last desperate attempt in tears. He's peeling this thing out, puts it on his head. And sure enough, almost like he's squinting, squint with me now, almost like he's squinting. He could almost barely see out. And he cleared out his eyes and he put it on his head and he could see, finally. But... Now that he could see his his hands and his body, he realized it was almost mystical. There was it was almost lagging as you as you move. You could see the remnants of his almost his spirit passing about. He does had his physical body, but he wasn't fully inhabiting it, so to speak, because it wasn't all there, of course. And the pumpkin was, of course, the only reason it worked that he could put it on his head because his spirit was there, um, trying to make some kind of a connection and it made a connection to this pumpkin and he thought well if I'm part ghost part body my timer must not have started yet because I'm not really fully alive I'm not really fully dead so maybe there's still time maybe I can find my head little did he know he did not have a head so he goes back to the 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 place where he, the slaughter happened the and, gosh, he couldn't even tell who won the battle at that point. It was a decisive blow. Many casualties on both sides, but with the help of this pumpkin, he was able to see around it. He couldn't find his head anywhere. He searched. He must have searched for several days. Um, but what he did find was his horse. See, he had been taken out, but his horse was actually able to escape. And somehow, finally, his horse had recognized him. The horse had left and was grazing in a pasture, but when he saw someone walk around, the horse walked up and was like, Hey, I know you. And this horse was not dead, of course, it was just him, but somehow the bond between Ryder and Steed was powerful enough, so he set off on his adventure um, with his pumpkin in place of his head on this black horse, searching, searching for his head, and... He soon put two and two together and realized that his head was not anywhere near, probably wasn't um, going to be able to find his head. It probably got destroyed. And he, he found that out begrudgingly after a little bit of time. But the problem was he still needed a head or else he would not be able to come back to life. He would not be able to take care of his parents and his siblings and his girlfriend. Although, unfortunately, time was running out. He knew that he did not have forever. If he could not find a solution to this impossible problem, he might either end up in an eternal purgatory or at the gates of hell. So, he's desperate at this point. He's frantic. He's searching for anything that will work. And, well, the pumpkin is kind of the best thing. It's kind of got the same 
feel. It's kind of hollow on the inside, right? You can carve it to make your face, right? It's about the same size as his head. This one's rather small, but the one he found was about the same size as his head. And since it acted like a substitute for his head, it bonded. And he actually went through quite a few pumpkins and found out the closer he could make it look to his legitimate face, the better he could see. And he, that clued him in that he actually had to find someone who looked like him find a head that looked like him and maybe just maybe he could take someone else's head and that could be a match now this was a, a big experiment for him but he had to do something he was a virtuous man he couldn't just kill people but of course if he didn't kill them then he would die but maybe that's a worthy sacrifice but if he died then what would happen to his family so he had to make a very tough decision. He decided that maybe he could find a head among his comrades. Um, I'll spare you the details. He didn't find much luck there. Um, of course, the life had already left them. Pumpkins are alive, or at least mostly alive. Um, they stay fresh for a fair amount of time. Um, cannot be said for his uh, comrades. So. He realized he had to find a fresh head. And that was when his turn for the worse really began. Because of course he had to find someone, find someone alive, take their head, which of course would kill the person, and then use it as his own. Um, and the closer that it looked like him, the closer he would get to coming back to life. Um, so he went searching. He was riding on his head, and that's why you hear the headless horseman. So he searches every night. He gallops around. He doesn't want to... At first, at least, he didn't want to take a lot of people's heads. He didn't want to kill any more than he had to. He only singles out people that are alone. So he went galloping around, finding people, stragglers, people away from their party or crew. And his first target, he saw them in the distance, and he steeled himself with a shaky hand. He drew his sword, because he knew what he had to do. He just didn't want to do it, but the guy seemed like a fine fellow, but sacrifices had to be made. So he gallops up. Gallop, gallop, gallop. The guy turns around. Who goes there? And one, one swoop, he takes the head off, and he almost doesn't even realize what he's done at that point. He's in such shock. He's so stunned. He's like, well, it's now or never. And he goes up and he's like, well, I've found a head. And he takes off the pumpkin, places this head upon where his head should be, and nothing happens. Like you can feel, He can feel the, the connection there, but it's just not the right head. See, human DNA is a lot more complex than a pumpkin. It's a bit more difficult to really make a connection and the the guy had different facial features. He had a different hair color, different skin color, different dye color, so it was very definitely not a good match. Um, and even if he found wood, he wouldn't really look much like himself when he went back to take care of his family, so he um, it, it just didn't connect. It, the pumpkin was even better, just because he could he could actually control the pumpkin, he could actually get inside the pumpkin and connect to it, but with this poor fellow's head, it just wasn't the same. Too many things just didn't line up, and it wasn't a blank slate where you could connect to anywhere. It was a complicated... It's, it's difficult to explain, the spirits are weird, but anyways, that head wouldn't work. So he went and searched for another. This time he found one with the same hair color. One swoop, took off the head, tried it on. He felt the connection a little bit better now, but every time he put it on, it would just fall right off. He couldn't control it, he couldn't keep it there, it wasn't connecting, it wasn't bonding. And this tragedy became an obsession for him. He soon, over the, the time he spent, it was now at least a year, he kept fighting, kept finding people. One at a time, he'd take their heads, and he got so desensitized to it at the end that he almost didn't think twice whenever he saw one alone. 
he even forgot what he looked like after a while, and that's the true tragedy. You look in a mirror, and all that he remembers is the pumpkin. The faces of his family slowly fading. And eventually, all memory of himself had lost. He lost himself. He had only this blasted pumpkin that was his one comfort. The one thing that he could connect to. The one thing he really felt attached to was the, the pumpkin he kept on his head. <laughs> of all things. Imagine that. But he keeps searching. They say he still searches to this day. I actually had an encounter with him myself. Must have been last year around this time. He was galloping in the middle of the night. I was going between them. Two towns. I was alone, like I usually am, trying to practice a song as I play, and of course I was making probably a little too much noise and it attracted his attention. But I hear galloping in the distance. I turn, and I see him there. And I'm just like, oh. That's not good, is it? So I... I turn and run, and I dash into the forest, and I'm like... Well, I guess this could be my end, but no, if I'm able to outsmart him, maybe I can get into the forest and I can get into away from where his magic lies. And I dash between the trees, but I think he's chasing after me, and he's he's by now pretty good at horse mastery and is able to convince the horse to make its way around the tree trunks and around the stumps, and he's still pursuing, but slower. I'm able to get enough speed that I'm able to continue for quite a distance until I finally forest ends and I'm out of options and I have to run down the path to plains but I know if I can get to the bridge get to the river then I might be able to find someone who can help so I run and I run like I've never ran before I was already out of breath but something inside me kept me going so I ran toward that bridge and I could hear in the distance the galloping clop the horrific cry of his horse and the the drawing of his blade as he rushes toward me, but I finally get to the bridge, and as I get to the bridge, there's one passing another way, a messenger, and he's dressed in red, of course he has a message from the king, he's on his way to deliver it, but he realizes that I'm in trouble, and he draws his sword and is prepared to fight this, this beast, this evil monster of the night, and he, he says, halt in the name of the king, stop where you stand. I think he was under pressure because the horseman was on a horse, not really standing, but anyways, so the horseman comes with a swing and the messenger's able to block it and they get into a pretty tough fight, but it's really just one powerful swing and then it gallops by, one powerful swing and then eventually they slow down. And, um, the messenger is really smart about this thing, he stays on the bridge where the... Um, just back far enough that the horseman still has plenty of room to ride around so that he's not convinced to go on the bridge because um, the horseman doesn't want on the bridge because then his mobility options are screwed but um, anyways messenger is really good at fighting I'm quite impressed anyways I was able to make my escape and messenger followed me shortly after and the headless horseman seems to give up try for someone else so I escaped narrowly escaped with the help of him so very um, very happy to have that anyways that is the story of the Headless Horseman and my encounter with him. I hope you enjoyed. I have several tales like this if you'd like to hear more. As for now, I wish you would do, and I hope you have the spookiest of Halloweens. Farewell.